So good evening to everyone who is listening to this talk. So I'll be talking about transposition of great arteries. It's a broad spectrum of uh, presentation of a disease, uh, but today we will be touching upon simple transposition of great arteries only. And maybe subsequently, we should uh, look at the other forms of transposition of great arteries. So before I go to transposition, I want you all to understand the normal heart. I'm sure all of you are familiar with this. So on the right, what you see is the oxygen poor blood, which travels from the right atrium to the right ventricle. And from there to the pulmonary arteries, all shown in blue. Via the pulmonary arteries, it goes to the lung where it gets oxygenated and then comes to the left side of the heart, that is the left atrium. And then it goes to the left ventricle and then to the aorta. So before it goes to the aorta, you can see two thin red vessels, which are called the coronary arteries. You can see them. What I'm anointing, is it visible? What I'm drawing on the screen, is it visible? Uh, no, ma'am. Ritika, could you tell me? Uh, no, no ma'am, okay. it's not. Fine. So then there is... No, not visible. Okay. So you can see two uh, small uh, vessels coming out of the aorta. These are the coronary arteries and they are supplying the heart itself. And then the aorta supplies blood to the rest of the body. So now in transposition, what happens is you have to understand a few terminologies here. So you know that the right atrium is connected to the right ventricle. This is called atrioventricular concordance. And when the right ventricle is connected to the pulmonary artery, I'll just go back to the previous slide. When the right ventricle is connected to the pulmonary artery, it's called ventriculo-arterial concordance. So RA connected to RV means atrioventricular concordance. And ventricle connected to the PA means ventriculo-arterial concordance. Similarly on the left side. Now here what happens, the right atrium is of course connected to the right ventricle, but the right ventricle is connected to the aorta. So here is the transposition which occurs of the great arteries. So the right ventricle gives rise to the aorta. So this is ventriculo-arterial discordance. So similarly, the left atrium is connected to the left ventricle, but the pulmonary artery arises from the morphological left ventricle. Again, ventriculo-arterial discordance. Now, we know that normally the heart, the blood flow in the heart is in series. The circulation is in series. RA, RV, pulmonary artery, left atrium, left ventricle, aorta. So it's like in series. But here it's parallel. So right atrium, right ventricle, aorta. Left atrium, left ventricle, pulmonary artery. There are two separate circulations existing together. So this is parallel circulation. As you can imagine, it is not compatible with life unless there is a mixer available somewhere. We'll talk about that mixer or various mixers that have to be anatomically present. So this is about what transposition looks like. So it's the most common form of cyanotic CHD that you will see in the newborn period. Almost 5 to 7% of all CHDs in the neonatal age uh, will be transposition of great arteries. It's very common seen in male patients and overall the incidence is 20 to 30 per 1 lakh live births. Usually the babies are normal birth weight and size. In fact, they might be a little larger babies also than usual. So we don't really know the etiology. It is presumed to be multifactorial. That is related to the mother, to the environment and even some genetic factors are now coming into play. And uh, we see it more common in older and diabetic mothers. So what happens to the physiology? So deoxygenated blood or oxygen poor blood, which returns to the right atrium from the body, will go through the right ventricle. So effectively, it bypasses the lungs. Now somehow blood does reach the lung. We'll see how. And once that happens, the purified blood returns to the left atrium from the lungs. 
It passes through the left atrium to the left ventricle, then goes into the pulmonary artery back into the lungs. So how does this baby survive? So it's incompatible with survival unless there is mixing of this oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. So it occurs at three anatomical levels. One is at the atrial level in the form of an atrial septal defect. Next is the VSD, ventricular septal defect, though the VSD is not as good a mixer as an ASD. If nothing is there, then at least a PDA should be there, which will allow for mixing. So now you can imagine blood that comes into the right atrium, across the ASD, goes into the left atrium, goes into the left ventricle, into the pulmonary artery, to the lungs, gets purified, comes to the LA again, getting mixed with deoxygenated blood, but crosses over across the ASD, same ASD, comes into the RA, goes to RV, and goes into the aorta. The child will not be completely pink, but he will be alive till we do something for him. Similar way, it will go across the VSD, but like I said, it's not a good mixer. And because of the low amount of oxygen provided to the body, transposition babies are also called as blue babies. You know, they also fall into the blue baby syndrome, like uh, truncus or uh, tetralogy of fallow, tricuspid atresia. So when you think of uh, TGA, in a newborn who is cyanotic in the first day of life itself, especially as soon as the child is awake and crying and there's no longer the maternal source of oxygen that is placenta going to supply the oxygen to the baby. So cyanosis will be noticed in the first few hours of life itself. And uh, within first few days, uh, they are quite sick and they don't make it beyond a certain point in time if they don't have mixers or we don't surgically or catheter-wise correct them. So how blue the child is, it depends on the defect that allows the blood to mix. If it has a fairly decent sized ASD and a PDA, they look fairly all right for a week or so. And if they don't have it, they're present early, maybe right after birth. So what happens if we don't do anything? Or in other words, the natural history. Hypoxia sets in. And this hypoxia, the more severe it is, it's an indication of lack of mixing. That is lack of oxygenated blood reaching the body. So once this anaerobic metabolism sets in, then you will start seeing acidosis on your blood gas. On ABGs, there will be acidosis. And uh, let us say there is intact interatrial septum and only a ductus. So all the blood keeps flowing back in on the left side, keeps circulating. They can even go into congestive cardiac failure if it is that subset or a large VSD over a month or two. So these kids can go into congestive cardiac failure. 90% of them generally do not survive beyond six months of life if uncorrected. So when there's intact interatrial septum without a PDA, this perhaps is the sickest group and if we do a balloon atrial septostomy or an emergency surgery, if the facility is existent, then uh, these kids can be salvaged, but otherwise we generally lose these kids quite early. If there's a VSD, they generally behave like any other VSD kid. Uh, their cyanosis is the least, but they can develop congestive cardiac failure. And what's more important is, though I said they tend to behave like a VSD, uh, they are different in the sense the pulmonary vascular obstructive disease, that is severe pH leading to PVOD, sets in much earlier. We don't see a four-month-old going into PVOD in a regular VSD, but here, for various reasons, they go into PVOD earlier. And a large PDA also will behave like a large VSD. If there's a VSD with some pulmonary stenosis, or maybe even more degree of pulmonary stenosis, the pulmonary stenosis protects the lungs, but surgically, it becomes a little more complex uh, problem to handle for us.